Well, good morning. Mom, I'm not connected, okay. Okay, I think, I think we're ready to go now. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, um, before we get into the lesson, uh, I guess number one, if you're a visitor here, we appreciate that you're here. Uh, if you were expecting to, um, to listen to Brad McNutt, uh, I apologize. He decided he wanted to go to May, uh, Maywood uh, this week. And so he and Brooke and the kids are taking a few other folks down to Maywood to, uh, to hang out with his folks from Mississippi for, for a week. Uh, but that leaves me um, on the tail end of EBS and up here before you today. So <clears throat> on the screen, you've got a, a, a picture from VBS. And, and I just have to tell you, I appreciate everybody and, and their participation in VBS. Uh, my wife does a really good job. She didn't, she didn't pay me to, to tell her, say this, but she loves doing this. And more so than that, we love watching your kids and even adults enjoy their time. And I keep calling it VBS. It's FBS, Family Bible School, but we really appreciate it. And the reason why I use this picture is because it's taken through the whole auditorium and the number of people that came. Not just our kids, not the adults that helped, but those that came to listen to our speakers. And for that, we're very thankful. Uh, as I was sitting there, I also want to say this. If you're missing... Um, a pillow or a blanket or any of that kind of stuff that's normal in your pew it likely could be up here at the front or it could be about uh, about midways back so if you're missing something we apologize uh, we felt like we need to move those back so if you're missing those that's where they may be <clears throat> so <clears throat> today we're going to talk about love for God so loved the world I asked Keith if he would lead that that song um, and understand this, that um, we're going to only scratch the surface. It's not even going to be close to what the love of God is. And I asked Keith to lead that song for a reason, because that third verse always seemed to really resonate with me because of the way the person that wrote it makes such a visible and vivid picture of how innate we are in being able to write about the love of God. But what's interesting about that, if, you'll, uh, if you look in the song book, it's song number 646, it actually gives credit where credit's due. But what's interesting about that is the third stanza was written around 1000 A.D., so 1050 A.D. I'm not even going to pretend to know the guy's name that wrote that, but it was a Jewish uh, poem, more or less, that's, that this man had wrote so many years ago. But the man who actually penned the first and second stanza of the song, Fred, uh, Frederick Lehman, he wrote it because he heard a preacher preaching about this man that was in an insane asylum that wrote this poem, the third stanza, on the wall. And the preacher was preaching about it. And Frederick Martin, uh, I'm sorry, Frederick Martin Lehman sat down after listening to it, and wrote the first two stanzas of the song, but he gave credit to this man who was in the same asylum, who later we found out was a Jewish poem that was written in 1050. He wanted to make sure that it transcended time. And here we are. I don't, I don't remember. It tells you that the date that that was written uh, in 1917. We're still singing that song today. But we're going to talk about the love of God. 
Now, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, months ago, we talked about God's power, and today we're going to talk about God's love. Um, like I said, we won't scratch the surface. We won't even get close. Um, you know, I, I'm going to throw Brad on the bus. He asked me sometime this week if I would speak, so <laughs> I had a few days to prepare, but here we are. So what is love? What's a simple definition of love? It's just a simple desire to make another one's life better. A way to sacrifice or to give so that someone else can have things better. There's a story written by O. Henry uh, called The Gift of the Magi. And it's a, it's a short story. Um, if you hadn't read it, I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit of a spoiler. Uh, but it's been written for a long time. Uh, some of you folks that are in high school, you'll read it at some point. But it's real simple. It's a real simple story, but it's a very powerful story. And it's about t- a young couple, not very old, that are just really struggling. Um, the, the, the wife's a homemaker. Um, she's, she's doing everything she can to save every penny. And I think at the time she has $1.87. And it's, it's coming up on Christmas, and she really wants to do something nice for her, her husband. And she's sitting there Christmas Eve trying to decipher, what do I do? I've got $1.87, and I want to give something for him. Well, the story talks about this man, he has this really nice gold watch that was his grandfather's that he'd handed down, had been handed down a couple of times, and she really, really, really wanted to give him something nice. So she walked through the mirror and saw her, her hair. Her hair was, was very long, and she says, I, I got an idea. So she goes down and she sells her hair for $20. Beautiful hair, beautiful, beautiful hair. She cuts it off and she sells it. And she goes and she searches and she finds the perfect chain to go with her husband's gold watch. So she comes home and she's waiting for her husband. Her husband doesn't show up. He's a little bit later than he normally is. He finally walks in the door and he just stands and he looks at her, not in distress, not mad, not frustrated, but just a different look than she had ever seen. And she's, she's there and she has very short hair. And he says, you don't like my hair? And asking these questions. And he says, no, it's fine. I love your hair, but I got you a gift. And she unwraps the gift. And the gift is a set of combs that she adored and wanted for her hair. They were made out of tortoise shell, and they had jewels and stuff that she just wanted. And so they eat supper, and they sit down on the couch. And she presents him with her gift. And he sits down and rubs his head and he said, well, maybe there'll be another watch. The husband, Jim, sold his watch to buy the combs. The wife, Della, sold her hair to buy the chain. They sacrificed for one another out of their love for each other. Their one prized possession they gave away so that somebody else could have it. It's a very simple story. If you haven't had a chance, just Google it, The Gift of the Magi. I'm not doing it justice. I'm just trying to give you a summary. But Google it. You can find it. It's, there's a PDF somewhere. It won't take you very long to read. Let's keep going. So <clears throat> there's four words um, that we associate or that the Greek used to describe love. Storge, I'm hoping that I'm saying that right. Storge. It's a familiar love. It's, it's a, a family type of love. It's a love that you have for people because they enjoy doing things that you do. Okay? And then you have eros. <clears throat> eros. Eros is, is a romantic kind of love. It's a romantic love. But the two I want to talk about today, specifically one, and we've all heard these, is phileo and agape. They're very, very similar. They're very, very similar. But they're not the same. Phileo is a love of affection. It is a love of affection, but it's, it's a love that, that's of the mind. It is a love, but it's a love of the mind. But agape love, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to move my, my uh, notes here.
And also, <clears throat> one other thing is it's mentioned 22, phileo specifically is mentioned 22 times in the New American Standard Version. But agape love, it is a love of affection, but it means to delight and to cherish in. And both of those can be used as a noun or a verb, but specifically, agape love is used 135 times, 35 times as a verb, and then another 115 times as a noun. Agape is the love of God. It's the love of God for his son. It's the love of God for his people. And it's the love that God asks us to use. Maybe this will work. Okay. <clears throat> so what does the love look like in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, it talks about his love being a covenant. In those verses, it specifically states, though, that his love will endure, but they also have something that they have to keep up to. They have to follow his commands. That it's his commands <clears throat> that these promises will continue to be kept. His love is not conditional, but there is a peace that for these promises and this covenant to happen, that there's, there's two pieces to that covenant. God loves them. God chose them. But to keep the covenant, there is a side that they must keep his commands. <clears throat> it says specifically that his loving kindness, in verse 12, which he swore to your forefathers, he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine and your, your oil, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to your forefathers. If you keep my commandments <clears throat> because you listen to these judgments and keep them in verse 10 he says this verse 10 I mean sorry chapter 10 and verse 15 in De Deuteronomy says yet on your uh, fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them and he chose their descendants after them even you above all people as it is this day even more so than that he chose them because he loved them and he didn't chose, choose them because they were great, but honestly because they were least. Okay? He also chooses them as a bride. In Isaiah 54, verse 5 and through 8, he writes about God choosing his people, that he loves them like a bride. And we know in the New Testament he talks that we're the bride of Christ, but God chose Israel to be his bride. And he wanted them and wanted what's best for his people. <clears throat> also in the Old Testament, we can look at Leviticus. And we can look at how he asked them to love people. Not to love those of each other, but those who are poor. To love the elderly. To be honest. Brad wrote the last couple of weeks about Psalm, I think it's 102. And he's, he's writing about how God chose those people and in his law he specifically states that we're supposed to do that to practice honesty to love your neighbor and to care for the poor when we have gardens and that sort of thing he he tells them leave a little bit so that those people can be taken care of too that's all in leviticus 19 so let's keep going <clears throat> there's also god's redeeming story of Hosea and just to make it very simple and short Hosea is told to marry Gomer okay they have three children Gomer sells herself and sells herself into slavery she becomes a harlot okay Gomer represents the children of Israel that turning away from God's God's uh, ways and what God's asked them to do and they have three children Jezreel and Jezreel represents the valley in which the Israelites will lose their military power and then they have another child, Lo Ruhamah, which basically means not loved. And then another child, Lo Amin, which means not my people. God says, I'm done with you. You're not following me. You won't do what I ask. So I don't love you. He's not saying that, but that's what this, this, this is uh, showing. And that you're no longer my people. But then he says, go 
He tells Hosea, go back, find Gomer, and bring her back into your midst. And change the name of the children, specifically Lo Ami <clears throat> and uh, Lo Ruhama, to say that they are loved and that you are my people. It's a story of God's redemption for his people in the Old Testament. Obviously, that's very <clears throat> points to, to the New Testament and what Jesus did on the cross. And obviously, we're not going to, to go through the love of God without mentioning that. But that's not where I want to necessarily focus. I want to get to, to 1 John chapter 4. But before we do that, we do have to look at a couple of things. Jesus agrees that <clears throat> with a scribe and a lawyer in two places in Mark chapter 12 and Luke uh, chapter 10 that the two greatest commands they start with the same first three three words you shall love you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart <clears throat> with all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength and the second was this that you should love you shall love your neighbor the lawyer and the scribe did the same thing said the exact same thing of course we know in Luke he goes on to tell the story uh, of the uh, of the Good Samaritan and, and we're not going to go into that but for Jesus and a scribe to, to be on the same page and knowing that the first two greatest commandments talk about love of course we can't go very far without talking about 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter okay Love, of, love is patient, love is kind. Faith, hope, and love abide these, but love being the greatest. Now, each time that God's using, or that we're talking about love, we're using agape love. He's speaking of agape love. Not phileo, but agape. Jesus has compassion on the multitudes. He sees them, that they're hungry, that they need to be fed. And he has compassion on them. And he feeds him. His love of Lazarus. Lazarus dies. And he's weeping. And people even can tell that he loved him. In John 15, <clears throat> he talks about his love for his disciples. Specifically, he calls them his friends. That I'll lay down my life for you. The love of the world. John 3, 16. And obviously through the cross. Jesus loves us. He loves the world. He loves everyone. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 4. This is where we'll spend the majority of the rest of our time. It explains what God's love is. What it's found and the things that he does. 1 John chapter 4. So first of all, <clears throat> in, in the first part of John, um, <clears throat> and, and I guess the more that um, you read John, I wouldn't say necessarily that he jumps around, but he, he, he uses different ideas, and he expounds on them, and he, he kind of comes back around to the same idea. and He, he repeats himself. It's kind of, a, I guess in the education world, it's, we, it's a spiral review. Okay? And so he, he can kind of lose you a little bit. Well, in the first part of John chapter 4, he's warning them against uh, these false teachers. He's warning them against the false teachers, and he's telling them, you've got to be, be careful and pay attention to what they're saying. That if they're not willing to confess that Jesus is Christ, that you need to watch out for them. And he's, he's telling them to watch out for, for those false teachers and also of Satan. Okay? But in verse 4, he says this. He gives an emphatic uh, personal pronoun in verses 4, 5, and 6. He starts in verse 4 with you. In verse 5, he says they. In verse 6, he says we. And I want us to understand those three and look at those three for just a second. Verse 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, talking about those false teachers because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world greater is he 
who is in you, he being Jesus, than he, Satan, who is in the world. Verse 5, they, those false teachers, false prophets, the Antichrist, Satan, are from the world. Therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We, the apostles, the chosen twelve, the people that God chose to follow Jesus that were called are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from the world does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So <clears throat> John is writing of himself and his cohorts, his apostles that were chosen when he says we. And he's going to use that from time to time in these, in these coming verses. Okay? Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Everyone <clears throat> who knows, who, who loves, is born of God and knows God. Very simple. But the love of the Father, it loves us. Verse, uh, if you go to chapter 3, if you look over in chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. We're the children of God, that the love of the Father was bestowed upon us. Verse 8, for God is love. I need to pause here and understand this. That God is love, but that's not all that he is. But love is not God. Love is not a deity. It's not a deity. Love is a portion of who God is. It makes up a part of him. It's one of his attributes. But it's not that love is a God. It doesn't work in reverse. It's not all that God is. Verse 9, he demonstrates his love. He demonstrates, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. This idea of the begotten Son is also written about Isaac, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham begot Isaac, just like God begot Jesus and it's used in that sense and it's the same sense and it's from the male side that it's referring to not the female but the male side that's referring to and that he says the same thing in Genesis 22 before he takes him or when he takes him up on the mountain and also in Hebrews when it's talking about the faith of Abraham turn to Romans 5 verse 6 and uh, Romans 5 starting in verse 6 he demonstrates his love through his, <clears throat> through his death. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, through, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, it says that in this, uh, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and his, hit, uh, sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, it's a big word, but basically it means to satisfy the judgment that's responsible, that we're responsible for. See, sin re requires us to have some type of response. It's a response from God and a response from ourselves. Now, if God loves us, how can he punish us? That's the question. If he's talking about love and punishment, that doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. But God has to punish us because of his holiness. <clears throat> and... Uh, and, it's, and propitiation is also used in 1 John 2 and verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also 
for those of the whole world. He didn't die just for the people that he's writing to. He didn't just die for Israel. He didn't just die for those who were going to read the word in that time and who the epistle was written for, but for the whole world. Not for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. <clears throat> in Hebrews 10 and verse 10, it tells us that we're sanctified through his offering. That his offering is what makes us, uh, that, that gives us this chance. By this, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So this idea of satisfaction of sin. So wrath is revealed through unrighteousness and ungodliness. Okay? When God, <clears throat> when we do bad things, the wrath of God has got to come down on us. It's a response. It's part of his holiness. So there's a quote um, in Who is Like the Lord, talking about the attributes of God, and it says this, the two great corollaries of God's holiness are his love and his wrath. They correlate with each other. When confronted with purity, righteousness, and obedience, God's love goes out in embrace and blessing. When confronted with impurity, rebellion, or sin, in any of its forms, it expresses itself in wrath. There has to be a response to sin. Because that's part of the covenant. When we sin, we are breaking that covenant. And there has to be a response. So what's that response? Christ the propitiation, he's satisfying what that response to sin would be. Okay? <clears throat> Let's keep going. Verse 12. No one has seen, seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now this is where John kind of can confuse you just a little bit because he's referring to himself and the apostles. When he says we, he's referring to himself and the apostles because they are the ones who actually saw these things. This is where God was revealed. He revealed himself to them, and they saw those things. <clears throat> By this we know that <clears throat> we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. But the thing is, is he wants not only them, but everybody to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1 I'm sorry, two, three, and four. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And furthermore, he didn't come into the world <clears throat> to judge, but he came that he might save them. And this is from our reading this morning. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Let's keep going. <clears throat> through our confession, he abides in him. Through, his, through our confession, Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know him and, <clears throat> and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in, in love abides in God, and God abides in him. John 14 and verse 15, it's very simple. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Verse 17, by this the love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in this day of judgment because as he is so also are we in this world there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love perfect love casts out 
fear. The love of God casts out the fear of punishment. Again, because he is the propitiation of our sins. And the last thing that I want to say is we've got to love each other. We've got to love each other. And through the love of God, we will love each other. First, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we can love, if we can't love somebody that we can see, how can we love God that we can't see? And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. We've got to love each other. Brotherly love, right? So I want to, I want to finish with this. And, and <clears throat> I've got to... I've got to say this. If I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, disappointed in myself. But Clinton um, has done a phenomenal job and several times in teaching about the restoration of Peter and using love. And he uses this example. And, <clears throat> and I've heard it once, maybe twice, and, and I kept getting it confused. And so Brad showed me a, a website to go to, and he helped, helped me look through uh, basically, it, it explains the Greek language, uh, but then it says it in English, too. And I'm reading through this, and I finally found it again. And, um, and so I, I, want, I want to make sure that I, I give Clinton a little bit of credit for, for putting this in my mind, uh, because he's, he spoke on this many times. But we, we read that Peter, before Jesus died and before he was taken into captivity, that he said this, I will lay down my life for you. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth, and I will lay down my life to you, for you. And that's in John 13 and 37. And we all know that Jesus denied, or that Peter denied Jesus three times. And the rooster crowed, and they made eye contact, and he wept. We all know that. But what's interesting <clears throat> is when, before Jesus ascends back to heaven, they're fishing. They're coming in and they see Jesus or they see someone and they realize that it's Jesus. Peter jumps out of the boat, swims ashore because he wants to see Jesus. And I think it says that it's the third time that Jesus had revealed himself to them because Jesus desired to eat a meal with them. And I think that he did. But the most important thing that happened that day was that he restored Peter back to this place. And to be honest with you, he didn't restore Peter. He was restoring Peter. Simon, the son of John. So he quit calling him Peter. Because Simon was his given name. Jesus gave him the name Peter. And so in John chapter 21, and they're on the beach, Jesus asked him a series of three questions. And it's important to look at those questions from this perspective that he asked a question, he asked the first two questions in one way, and he asked the third question in a different way. And Peter's response is very interesting. So it says this, the first two times, Jesus says, Do you love agape from the heart, me? That's Jesus' question. But Peter's response is this, You know that I affectionately, with my mind, phileo, love you he asked him again he says Peter do you love me do you with your heart agape the love that I have that God has for me and I have for you and for the people do you love me and he says you know that I affectionately phileo with my mind I love you he asked him a third time but the third time, Jesus says this, Peter, do you have affection with your mind? Phileo, do you love me? Peter gets upset. He knows that he's asking him three times. He denied him three times. He understands that. But Jesus changed his language to match Peter. And Peter responds, I phileo with my mind. I love you. Jesus meets Peter where he's at. 
But not only that, there's something to be said that Peter had taken a step in the right direction. Instead of saying, I will die for you, I will die with you, I said I was. I said that I, agape, with my heart, love you. But I can't do that. I failed. I'm confessing that I can't do that. You know that I affectionately, with my mind, I love you, but not with my heart. But Jesus meets him where he's at. And he gives him a command to feed his sheep. Shepherd his sheep, tend his sheep, tend his lambs each time. Of course, we know that Peter goes on to be a big part of the early church. Preaches the first gospel lesson. Converted thousands of people. And we still read about it today. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son that ever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God loves us. He loves us. There's still wrath that goes along with that, but that's where Jesus comes in. He takes that away. You may be sitting there, you may need um, prayers of the church. Uh, you, you may... You may have made those same confessions that Jesus or that Peter did. And you may have things that you'd like to say to the church and have us pray over. Or there may be those, there, those of you that want to confess that Jesus is Christ and that you want to repent of your sins and be baptized uh, for the remission of your sins. If you'd like to do that, you may do so as we stand, as we sing.